So I wrote this blog uh, for the Cobb Institute's blog just recently. It was published June 15th. And, um, you know, just exploring some ideas around what I think are the deeper roots of mass shootings, because it seems to me that our discussion always ends up in just sort of two topics related to this broader topic. And I thought that there was more that needed to be looked at. So the, you know, I'll kind of, like I said, go through what's in the, in the blog. So basically, you know, the, we all know this is a serious problem. You know, according to NPR, there have been 246 mass shootings just in the first 22 weeks of this year. I'm sure it's more now, uh, which is like 11, more than 11 shootings per week. And the New York Times talks about a new disturbing pattern of shooters who are under the age of 21. Um, and, and they point to various causes like online bullying, um, the aggressive marketing of guns to boys. Of course, they're being, they're being marketed to girls as well. Um, and then a worsening adolescent mental health crisis that's only been made worse by the pandemic. And then uh, Frank McAndrew, who's a psychology professor at Knox College, talks about that the young men who are typically involved in these shootings, he describes them as people who feel like losers and they have an overwhelming drive to show everybody that they are not on the bottom. But, you know, I think the, our conclusions typically within the, you know, kind of polarized ideological camps in the U.S. tend to say it's the guns or it's the people, it's mental health. And, you know, those of us who have struggled with mental health, like depression, anxiety, you know, uh, cringe at sort of being lumped into the same category, uh, you know, as we being people who are never violent, lumped into the same mentally ill uh, or mental health challenged people as those who are violent and kill others. And I, you know, I think that that's, too simplistic of an answer. Um, and so rather than just continuing to argue at that level between these two ideas, I'm suggesting that the roots of this crisis may lie even deeper than, than these two points. And until we're willing to go all the way down and follow the threads down to the, the deeper roots of these uh, shootings, I don't think we'll ever, ever uh, fix the problem. And so, you know, now I, we could talk about other roots, that I'm sure, but the three that I bring up to the surface are cultural fragmentation, uh, an epidemic of trauma, and widespread demoralization. And I think, you know, I wrote about this in my, in my dissertation at Claremont School of Theology, which then became a, a book called A Process Spirituality, where I talk about the fragmentation in Western culture, but, you know, in the U.S. specifically, being at, at the levels, at the societal level, at the interpersonal level, and at the intrapersonal level, meaning within ourselves, that we are fragmented at all of these levels. And, and I point to the Western worldview as partly responsible for that, that the Western, the dominant worldview in the West uh, is a dualistic view that separates mind from body and humans from nature. It's also stubbornly mechanistic, even though, you know, what we have learned through Things like quantum mechanics uh, shows us that the world isn't the, a machine and neither are we or the animals that live in this world with us. But people still generally tend to see reality as made up of, you know, dead inert matter that's shoved around like billiard balls by external forces. And, you know, ecology shows us that, uh, along with quantum physics, that nothing in the world behaves like a machine. And I think these dualistic and mechanistic views pull us apart and deny the, the validity of our experience. And they look at humans and the world as objects to be exploited rather than sacred subjects with which we might be in a cooperative and respectful relationship. And that is fragmenting. Trauma you know, we, we has been shown to be really wide, more widespread, I think, in our culture than most people realize. I'm just going to point really quickly to a study that was done uh, in the late 1990s called the ACE study, 
that was a part in partnership with the CDC and Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. And Vincent Felitti of Kaiser Permanente and Robert Anda of the CDC conducted this groundbreaking study of 17,000 adults, at least in the first round, um, who all were part of the Kaiser Permanente health system. So they were all, you know, predominantly middle class Americans who had health insurance and all of that. And they asked them about their early life experiences. And these three, 10 categories were identified as adverse childhood experiences under broader categories of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Um, and so when they, I, when they questioned the people who participated in the study, they gave, you know, each person had a one point given to them for every category that they'd experienced. So 10 categories, the highest score was 10. Now, since this study, there have been other studies done. There was a big one done in Philadelphia, in other settings, more urban settings, and they've identified other types of categories like peer-to-peer -peer bullying and poverty, actually, and, and among others. So it's not just these 10 anymore. Um, but the findings were stunning in this in this study that it's only a third of participants uh, had an ACE score of zero. One in six had a score of four or more, and one in nine had a score of five or more. And the uh, researchers found an alarmingly strong correlation between having a higher ACE score and the leading causes of morbidity, mortality, chronic disease, risky behavior. You know, so I won't go into the detail, but it was unbelievable how the more, the higher the score off the charts was the correlation with various things like COPD, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, risky behaviors, you know, all kinds of things. So I think we can say that we are a traumatized people. In an article in a publication, a, a website called Aces Too High News, a researcher named Jane Allen Stevens, you know, asks, was specifically responding to, uh, the, I think, the shooting in, in Buffalo, it was when she wrote this, and talked about, you know, that we, we want to know why when mass shootings happen. So we immediately look for the shooter's motives. But she questions that approach and says, you know, rather than looking for, you know, dwelling so much on motive, which just gets us, she says, a useless answer to the wrong question, the right questions, she says, would be things like, what happened to this person? Like the Peyton Gendron who shot the, the people in the grocery store in Buffalo. What happened, she says, to this beautiful baby boy to turn him into an 18-year-old killer spouting racist screed? And um, she draws from work of some other researchers who have studied every mass shooting since 1966 and found that the vast majority of shooters experienced early childhood trauma and exposure to violence at a young age. And their uh, trauma included parental suicide, physical or sexual abuse, neglect, domestic violence, and severe bullying. And uh, she goes on to say, the effects of ACEs begin showing up in childhood kids experiencing trauma act out. They can't focus, they can't sit still, or they withdraw. Fight, flight, or freeze, that's a normal and expected response to trauma. So they have difficulty learning. The schools that respond by suspending or expelling them just further traumatize them. When they get older, if they have no positive intervention from a caring adult, at home or in school, in a clinic or other organization who's trained to understand trauma, they find unhealthy ways to cope. They turn to addictions of all types, alcohol and other drugs, violence, stealing, lying, overeating, gambling, thrill sports, et cetera, to soothe themselves, to endure their trauma and the effects of their trauma, such as depression or violence. And she recommends that we do like a forensic ACE review after every shooting, where we really investigate the shooter's childhood and early experiences, and then analyze every step when an intervention might have changed the course of that person's life and the outcome. And so she asks, you know, will we take seriously the prevention of trauma? And then can our woundedness become a source of healing rather than shame? Now, this issue of demoralization is very interesting. A, a psychology academic and author, John Schumacher, 
wrote an article called The Demoralized Mind. And uh, where he really points to our Western consumer culture as creating a psycho-spiritual crisis that leaves us disoriented and bereft of purpose. And he talks about that people who really, uh, in this culture, really develop an existential disorder, which he says, uh, describes as a breakdown of our cognitive map and talks about how people are unable to locate meaning or purpose or sources of need fulfillment. And they're filled often with doubt, uncertainty, loss of direction. Uh, and then, you know, they feel a sense of frustration and anger and bitterness and uh, have a sense of that they're part of a lost cause or a losing battle. And he says that demoralization is a realistic response to the circumstances impinging on that person's life. I mean, just how sad is that? And he talks about uh, that the, the core characteristics of our consumer culture, individualism, overwork, hurriedness, debt, hypercompetition uh, are all part of this problem. And that typical sources of wisdom and social and community support, spiritual comfort, intellectual growth, and life education have dried up. You know, we are a secular society and a lot of the ways that people found the, you know, these other sources of wisdom, they don't have access to them anymore in the same way that people might have in earlier times. And so he said, people no longer have guiding principles or philosophies of life that give them an existential compass. And they develop instead then a philosophy of futility. And for them, he says, the world itself is disappointing and life is without credibility. And I you know, bring in J uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti who said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So I, and I think we are a profoundly sick society. And if we are, then what might make us well? Well, I think that we might, a process relational worldview is something that I think could counteract this fragmentation that we have in, in our culture. Uh, a, view, a worldview that shows that we are interconnected, that we are, uh, that all of life is dynamically in process and that we are actually not futile and not without meaning or value, but that we are actually creatively empowered to actualize value in a world that we belong to. We belong to the world. Uh, in a relational world, then we're never alone. We are interconnected, intimately related to everything in the world. And it, that it can show us this kind of worldview, I think, can show us that we matter, we belong, and we can experience positive change. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. And like I said, if the topic of religious pluralism interests you, please, um, jump on to that August 18th event. We've also got a few other neat things coming up. I'll tell you about real quick. Um, they're not on the website yet, but you'll be hearing about them if you either are signed up as a member of Process and Faith or are on the newsletter lists for the Center for Process Studies. Um, there's uh, September 30th, a three hour seminar that we're doing um, that is gonna called Process Thinking and Human Living. And this, this first one, this first event is going to feature um, Patricia Adams Farmer, uh, Andrew Davis, Bruce Epperly, and myself. And we're doing it, co-convening it with two organizations, one in Australia and one in Singapore. So it's going to be like 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern on a Friday night, which is their Saturday morning. But we want U.S. people and other people in parts of the world to come too. And then we might do a second one in the spring on uh, world, world, different religious traditions, not all of them, but at least a few with process thinking. And then um, we've, we're just, uh, well, I've got a class that I'm working on with a guy named Doug King, that's going to be looking at um, the biblical narrative through the lens of spiral dynamics, and, and, and how he comes to the conclusion that the biblical narrative is a message of universal God identity. So that'll be pretty interesting. 
and uh, we're talking about some other interfaith kinds of events coming up. So like I said, if you haven't already signed up on Process in Faith or with CPS, do that and you'll, you'll hear about all these things coming up.